Hi class, so today we're going to start um, our little mini unit on the 1920s. And uh, we're going to be learning about this entire decade over the next couple of days. And so um, we're going to start with the 19th Amendment, so the push for women's right to vote. We're going to look at urbanization and immigration during this period. We're going to look at um, the reaction to that immigration in the form of nativism, which we've, we've talked about before, but I'm going to talk more about that during this period. Uh, we're going to talk about religious fundamentalism, the reemergence of the KKK, prohibition, um, 1920s consumption, right? Uh, during this period, it was a period of unprecedented economic growth, and people were able to buy many more things, much more than they used to before this. Uh, we're going to talk about movies, radio, sports. We're going to talk about just American culture during this time. And we're going to end off with uh, the politics of the 1920s. And uh, some of the presidents that took office during this period um, just before the Great Depression, which will be our final unit. So let's start with uh, the 19th Amendment, right? So the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified in 1920, right? And it declared that, um, you know, everyone has a right to vote regardless of their sex. So that, uh, that provided, it granted women the right to vote. And it really represented the pinnacle of the women's suffrage movement. Um, and it lasted decades. It was a decades long fight. So the women's suffrage movement actually has its origins in the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848. And that was the very first women's rights convention ever held in the United States. About 300 activists, both female and male, gathered there to discuss the condition of women and to try to come up with strategies for achieving social and political rights for women. Uh, the first women's suffrage organizations were created in 1869 by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, they founded the National Women's Suffrage Association, the NWSA. And there was another association founded by a, a few other women named uh, the American Women's Suffrage Association. And these two rival groups were divided over the 15th Amendment which guaranteed African-American men the right to vote. The AWSA, the second organization I mentioned, they supported the 15th Amendment, while the NWSA, the one founded by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they opposed it because it didn't include suffrage for women. Then, in 1890, these two competing organizations merged together into one organization called the National American Women's Suffrage Association. So during the 1970s, suffragists, which are women who were activists for suffrage, for getting women the right to vote, that's what they're called, they began attempting to vote at polling places. And they started filing lawsuits um, when, they, uh, when their attempts to vote were rejected. And this drew attention to the women's rights movement, especially uh, after Susan B. Anthony was arrested and put on trial for voting in the 1872 election. So suffragists, they hoped that the lawsuits that they were filing would work um, and let them go to the Supreme Court and that the justices there would declare that women had a constitutional right to vote. However, in 1875, the Supreme Court actually ruled that the U.S. Constitution did not give the right of suffrage to anyone. So after that ruling, leaders of the women's rights movement, they began to adopt uh, other strategies for trying to secure voting rights. So activists began organizing a drive to pass a constitutional amendment guaranteeing women the right to vote. So the NAWSA, the, that newly merged organization, they launched a campaign to achieve victories at the state level in the hopes that you know, if enough states allowed women the right to vote, then maybe the federal government would, would have followed suit and do the same thing. And these efforts were uh, so successful that by the time of the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, over half of all states had already granted limited voting rights to women. So on the right here is a map showing the different degrees of suffrage uh, voting rights prior to the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And there was some opposition to women's suffrage. Even though the movement for women's suffrage was well-organized and gained momentum 
um, by the early 20th century, it was met with strong opposition from some sectors of American society. So for example, brewers and distillers, people who made alcohol, right? They were opposed to female enfranchisement. They didn't want women to have the right to vote because they assumed that women would vote for the prohibition of alcoholic beverages. So outlawing alcohol. And businesses that employed children feared that women would vote to eliminate child labor. So anti-suffrage, women's suffrage organizations sprang up all over the country to try to oppose uh, the women's rights to vote. And anti-suffrage activists were, they weren't just men. Actually, many upper class women joined the movement and they argued that politics was just this dirty business that was the authority of men, really, and that women shouldn't get involved in politics. So even some women were opposing it. Um, then in January 1878, you had Republican Senator uh, Aaron A. Sargent. He introduced the sent into the Senate a constitutional amendment, which would guarantee women the right to vote. And that bill that he proposed basically just sat there. Um, it wasn't until 1914 um, that another constitutional amendment for women's rights was considered. But in 1914, it was rejected again. Then in the following year, a woman named Carrie Chapman Catt, who had succeeded Susan B. Anthony, she became the leader of the National American Women's Suffrage Association in 1900. And she launched an effort to try to link women's suffrage to the American war effort in the First World War in World War I. So even though many of her fellow suffragists were anti-war pacifists, that means they didn't want, they didn't like war, they didn't like violence. Even though many of her fellow suffragists were pacifists, she made the controversial decision to support the war and to portray the women's suffrage movement as patriotic. And this effort was a success. In his 1918 State of the Union address, President Woodrow Wilson declared his support for free female um, suffrage for female enfranchisement. So on August 18th, 1920, Congress ends up ratifying the 19th Amendment, which guaranteed the right to vote to all U.S. citizens, regardless of sex. And it really represented a major victory and a turning point in the women's rights movement. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, urbanization and immigration. So during the Gilded Age, the population of the United States had started to shift sharply towards living in urban rather than rural environments. We learned this already. In 1900, about a, one third of the American population lived in cities, um, which you know they were drawn there by the wide availability of factory jobs, remember? But by 1920, the scales finally tipped. And for the first time, the majority of people in the United States lived in cities. It was the beginning of a new modern era. And we've talked about in other lessons about the economic opportunities that the cities provided for both international immigrants and internal migrants, like the half a million African Americans who left the South in the years surrounding World War I, remember the Great Migration, uh, as they searched for a better life in the North. Although factory jobs were subject to dangerous working conditions and wages were low for both immigrants and Southern African Americans, the pay and the standard of living was usually an improvement on their previous circumstances. The transition to life in the modern industrial city also offered new opportunities for women. With the rise of big corporations doing business across time zones and countries, there was an increasing need for clerical workers, secretaries, and typists. Uh, white women began to take on these jobs, these roles. And by the end of the 1920s, about 25% of women worked outside the home. Women also began to fill the ranks and employment categories that were beginning to be defined as female professions, like for example, nursing and teaching. And a growing number of women continued to work even after they were married. Uh, these kinds of clerical jobs were generally closed to minority women, meaning minority women weren't able to work those jobs. Um, minority women whose options for work outside the home were really limited to domestic service or agricultural labor. Although some, some African American women began to train in segregated institutions for service in segregated institutions, for example, con uh, going to, to black nursing schools in order to work in black hospitals. So that, that did happen. It just wasn't on a big scale. 
the mass production techniques of the 1920s also meant that the price of consumer goods dropped so that average people could afford to buy appliances and even cars. Uh, people had enough disposable income to go to the theater or to an amusement park or to a speakeasy, um, illegally buying and selling alcohol. Uh, after the prim and proper progressive era and the trauma of World War I, many people embraced a carefree attitude of self-fulfillment through uh, leisure and consumption, or um, in other words, you know, having fun and buying stuff, right? But not everyone was thrilled with this new modern era of diverse city living. Uh, during World War I, an emphasis on 100% Americanism basically squelched dissenters who protested against the draft or questioned U.S. involvement in the war. And then after the Russian Revolution, labor strikes and a series of bombings in 1919, this led to fears that you know radical communists were threatening the country and anarchists. And these incidents combined with the flawed racial pseudoscience of the day that cast all people other than those descended from Northern and Western Europeans as less evolved, led to a growing sense among native born white Protestants that the country was becoming less and less American. Um, these fears led to the passage of new uh, immigration restrictions in the 1920s. In 1921, Congress passed the Emergency Quota Act, which limited the number of immigrants allowed from Europe to 350,000, or about a third of pre-World War I levels. Then in 1924, Congress limited immigration even further with the Immigration Restriction Act. And this act set quotas of immigrants who could arrive from each nation. Uh, the quotas heavily favored immigrants from Northern and Western Europe and slashed the number of Southern and Eastern European immigrants down to as little as 1% of their pre-World War I yearly numbers. Um, Africans from all countries were uh, limited to just 1,000 immigrants per year, and Asians were completely barred from entry. The law did not limit the immigration of Mexicans, whom many Western farmers relied on for seasonal labor. Um, interestingly, in 1924, Congress also passed a law establishing that all Native Americans were now U.S. citizens, although they often had difficulty accessing the rights of citizenship from reservations. So what do these quotas and efforts at defining the racial makeup of the United States tell us about, you know, who was considered eligible to be part of the American people in the 1920s? So as we move forward into talking about the Great Depression and World War II, keep thinking about the ways that citizenship is defined and how that definition changes over time. And here is an image from 1920s Detroit, right? What it would have looked like in Detroit, Michigan in the 1920s. So now let's talk about nativism and fundamentalism. So, you know, while prosperous middle-class Americans found much to celebrate about this era of leisure and consumption, many Americans, often in rural areas, they disagreed on the meaning of a good life and how to achieve it. And they reacted to the rapid social changes of modern urban society with a vigorous defense of religious values and a fearful rejection of cultural diversity and equality. So beginning at the end of the 19th century, immigration into the United States rocketed to never before seen heights. Remember when we were learning about that in our previous units, how, how much immigration had increased. Many of these new immigrants were coming from Eastern and Southern Europe. And for many English speaking, native born Americans of Northern European descent, the growing diversity of new languages and customs and religions really triggered anxiety and racial animosity. So in reaction, some embraced nativism which is prizing, basically it's prizing white Americans with family trees over more recent immigrants. So it's anti-immigration sentiment and rejecting outside influences in favor of their own local native customs, whatever native means, right? So nativists, they stoked a sense of fear over the perceived foreign threat of immigrants. They pointed to the anarchists assassinations of the Spanish prime minister in 1897, the assassination of the Italian king in 1900, 
And they even pointed to President William McKinley's assassination in 1901 as proof that immigrants were that need, needed to not be allowed in, right? That they were a threat to America. So following the Bolshevik re revolution in Russia, the communist revolution in Russia, the sense of, a, of an inevitable foreign or communist threat really grew among those who were already predisposed to not liking or distrusting immigrants. The sense of fear and anxiety over this rising tide of immigration really came to a head with the trial of two men named Nicola Sacco and Bartol uh, Bartolomo uh, Vanzetti. Uh, they were Italian immigrants who were accused of participating in a robbery and murder in Massachusetts in 1920. Um, even though there was no there was no direct evidence that was linking them to this crime but you know because they were immigrants both men were also anarchists right they favored the destruction of the american market-based capitalistic society through violence they wanted to th overthrow the government and get rid of it so they were immigrants and they were anarchists and at their trial um they their radical views were emphasized they were focused on and the jury found them guilty on July 14th, 1921. And despite, you know, them trying to appeal the decision, um, despite, you know, some of the, the evidence not really showing that they, that they had actually committed this crime, right, based on ballistics testing and uh, recanted testimony and a confession from an ex-convict, despite all of that, both men were found guilty and executed in 1927. And opinions on this trial tended to, to divide over, type to divide along nativist immigrant lines, with immigrants supporting the innocence of the two men here, and obviously the nativists supporting the, uh, their guilty verdict. So the verdict really sparked protests from Italians and other immigrant groups, as well as from some intellectuals. Um, so like even Albert Einstein protested this. And Muckraker, or Muckraker Upton Sinclair, he also uh, based one of his documentary novels on the American justice system, based it on their trial. And he basically considered this a gross miscarriage of justice. And he, he was outraged by this. And one of the most articulate critics of the trial was a professor from Harvard named Felix Frankfurter. And he would end up being appointed to the Supreme Court by Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1939. And he wrote in The Atlantic, um, a newspaper, six years after the trial, he said, uh, by systematic exploitation of the defendant's alien blood, their imperfect knowledge of English, their unpopular social views, and their opposition to the war, the district attorney invoked against them a riot of political passion and patriotic sentiment. And the trial judge connived at one had almost written cooperated in the process. So he's basically like saying it was an unfair trial at the end of the day. It was unfair. It wasn't just. So um, to preserve the ideal of American homogeneity, right? The Congress, again, they passed that Emergency Immigration Act, the, uh, which you know introduced limits on European immigration, introduced quotas. They passed the National Origins Act of 1924, which actually went further, and it lowered the level to 2% of the 1890 census. So it was basically reducing, again, the number of Southern and Eastern Europeans that could come to the United States um, dramatically. Um, and when the president signed this bill into law, he declared, America must be kept American, right? Now let's talk a little bit about religious fundamentalism, faith and science. The negative opinion many native born Americans held towards immigration was in part a response to the process of post-war urbanization, the growth of cities. Cities were swiftly becoming centers of opportunity, but the growth of cities, especially the growth of immigrant populations in those cities, sharpened rural discontent, anger over the perception of rapid cultural change. As more of the population flocked to cities for jobs and quality of life, many left behind, many people who were left behind in rural areas felt that their way of life was being threatened. To rural Americans, the ways of the city seemed sinful and extravagant, 
Um, whereas people living in urban areas viewed rural Americans as like hopelessly behind the times, right? They needed to catch up. And in this conflict, in this divide, Tennessee lawmakers drew a battle line over the issue of evolution and its contradiction of the accepted biblical explanation of history. Um, remember Charles Darwin, he had published his theory of natural selection in 1859. And by the 1920s, many standard textbooks in the United States schools contained information about his theory of evolution. And fundamentalist Protestants targeted evolution as being representative of all that was wrong with uh, city life. And Tennessee, the state of Tennessee passed something called the Butler Act and made it illegal to teach any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as it's taught in the Bible and made it illegal to teach that man has descended from a lower order of animals. So basically outlawed the teaching of evolution. And the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, they hope to challenge this act as an infringement of the freedom of speech. And the ACLU enlisted a teacher and a coach named John Scopes. And um, it was suggested that he may have taught evolution while substituting for a sick biology teacher. And town leaders in, in Tennessee, in Dayton, Tennessee, for their part, they sensed this as an opportunity to promote their town, which had lost more than one third of its population in the previous years. And they welcomed the ACLU to stage a test case against the Butler Act. The ACLU and the town got their wish and you had the Scopes monkey trial take place as it was publicized. It was called this by the newspapers. And it quickly turned into a carnival that captured the attention of the country and it really epitomized the nation's urban rural divide. Um, William Jennings Bryan, who we, we've learned about before, he argued the case for the prosecution. So he was trying to prosecute and find the teacher guilty of teaching evolution. Um, remember, he was a presidential candidate. He was William Will Woodrow Wilson's secretary of state. Um, and he, in the preceding years, he had been preaching across the country about the spread of secularism and the declining role of religion in education. And he, uh, William Jennings Bryan even offered $100 to anyone who would admit to being descended from an ape. And then you had the, the other side was led by a man named Clarence Darrow. He was a prominent lawyer and agnostic, which means he wasn't atheist, but he also, he didn't believe in religion either. And he led the defense team to defend the teacher. And his statement that Scopes isn't on trial, civilization is on trial, no man's belief will be safe if they win, really struck a chord, that, that statement struck a chord in society. And the outcome of the trial uh, was that Scopes, the teacher, was found guilty and fined $100. And that outcome wasn't really ever in question because he himself admitted he had confessed to violating the law. But the trial itself proved to be very dramatic. The drama only escalated when Darrow, the defense attorney, he made the choice of calling William Jennings Bryan as an expert witness on the Bible. And he knew that William Jennings Bryan believed in a literal interpretation of the Bible. And so Darrow peppered Bryan with a series of questions that were designed to ridicule uh, Bryan's religious belief. And the result was that those who approved of the teaching of evolution saw Brian, William Jennings Bryan as foolish, whereas many rural Americans considered the cross-examination as an attack on the Bible and their faith. So let's talk about the KKK. So the KKK was a viciously racist white supremacist organization, and it first arose in the South after the end of the Civil War. Its members opposed the dismantling of slavery and they wanted to keep African-Americans in a permanent state of subjugation to whites. During Reconstruction, the KKK employed violence and terror in the hopes of overthrowing Republican state governments in the South and trying to maintain ra their racial hierarchy that they had before the war. The first KKK declined in the 1870s, and that was partly due to the passage of federal laws that were aimed at prosecuting the crimes of the KKK. Uh, 
Um, but some local small cells continued to operate. The institutionalization of Jim Crow laws, Jim Crow segregation in the South, meant that the KKK's desire to maintain racial hierarchy had already been achieved. So they felt that's also what led to their decline because their goal had already been achieved. Um, but then it reemerges. The, the, re, the KKK had reemerged in the South in 1915, but it wasn't until after the end of World War I that the organization experienced a national resurgence. Membership in the KKK skyrocketed from a few thousand members to over 100,000 in like about 10 months. Local chapters of the KKK sprang up all over the country. And by the 1920s, it had become a truly national organization with a presence in the South, but also in New England, the Midwest, and all across the Northern US. The members of the KKK were mostly white Protestant middle-class men, and they viewed their crusade in moral and religious terms. They saw themselves as vigilantes restoring justice, and they used intimidation, threats of violence, and actual violence to prevent African-Americans, immigrants, Catholic, Catholics, Jews, liberals, and progressives from attaining wealth, social status, and political power in the United States. Um, their members, the KKK, wore elaborate costumes with distinctive white hoods to try to mask and hide their identities. They held nocturnal rallies, so basically rallies at night to plot acts of terror, and they wanted to grow hatred against people who they deemed not truly American basically anyone they believe who was not white and Protestant. And the activities of the KKK ranged from issuing threats to burning crosses to outright violence and atrocities like tarring and feathering, beating, lynching, and assassination. Um, the revival of the KKK in the early 20th century really reflected a society that was struggling with the effects of urbanization, immigration, and industrialization. The uh, KKK chapters in major urban areas expanded because many white Americans became bitter and resentful about immigration from Asia and Eastern Europe. The members of the KKK, some of them complained that these immigrants were taking jobs away from whites and that they were diluting the racial purity of American society. Um, and obviously, given that the country had been populated by immigrants from the very beginning, these ideas of racial purity were complete myths, right? Ridiculous. Um, let's talk a little bit about propaganda and protests in regards to the KKK. So D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation, which I've talked about in a previous lesson, it was released in 1915. And it is a form of propaganda. It was a sympathetic portrayal of the KKK, and it was hugely popular with American audiences. President Woodrow Wilson even arranged for a private screening of this film at the White House. And this film reflected and boosted the popularity of the KKK in the United States. Um, on the left is um, the... the um, the image of the movie, right? It's the poster, I should say. Many influential people and organizations, they did come out against, in opposition to the KKK. Religious and civics groups launched campaigns to try to educate American society about the crimes and atrocities that were committed by the KKK. Uh, you had Protestant ministers, Catholic priests, Jewish rabbis. They all stepped forward to try to condemn the organization, to condemn the KKK um, very clearly. The NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, was really at the forefront of efforts to educate the public about the threat posed by the KKK. And this anti-KKK activism was highly effective. It worked. And the organization's membership, the KKK's membership, declined dramatically in the late 1920s. Um, Unfortunately, the KKK would experience another revival and resurgence in the South during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, which you will certainly talk about next semester. Now let's talk about prohibition. So prohibition was a nationwide ban on the sale and import of alcoholic beverages, and it lasted from 1920 to 1933. 
the roots of the temperance movement was this, which was this movement to ban alcohol. It stretched all the way back to the early uh, 1800s. Um, during the progressive era, you had calls for prohibition that became more strident. In many ways, temperance activists were seeking to address the negative social effects of rapid industrialization, right? Um, you had many religious sects and denominations, and especially Methodists who became active in the temperance movement. Women were inf especially influential as well. Um, they were one of the leading advocates of prohibition. Um, saloons and the heavy drinking culture that they fostered were really associated with immigrants and members of the working class and were seen as detrimental to the values of Christian society. So um, something that came about from that was the Anti-Saloon anti League, and it had strong support from Protestants and other Christian denominations, and they really spearheaded the drive for nationwide prohibition. In fact, the Anti-Saloon League was the most powerful political pressure group in U.S. history. No other organizations ever managed to alter the nation's constitution as they have. On the right here is a picture of sheriff's deputies. They are dumping illegal alcohol found in California. This is actually in Orange County in 1932. So the 18th Amendment was ratified on January 16th, 1919, and it went to effect in 1920. And the 18th Amendment was the, the ban on the sale and importing of alcohol the distribution and production of alcohol, alcoholic beverages. And it really reflected the progressives' faith in the federal government's ability to fix social problems. That's what they were trying to do. And the law didn't specifically outlaw the consumption of alcohol, right? Um, and because of that, many citizens, U.S. citizens, they ended up stockpiling personal reserves of beer, wine, and liquor before the ban took effect. Um, even though the advocates of prohibition had argued that banning sales of alcohol would reduce criminal activity, it in fact directly contributed to the rise of organized crime. After the 18th Amendment went into force, bootlegging, which is the illegal distillation and sale of alcoholic beverages, became widespread. Al Capone was the most notorious of the prohibition era gangsters who made their fortunes from bootlegging, from the illegal distillation and sale of alcohol. Um, many law enforcement agencies simply lacked the resources that they needed to consistently and effectively enforce prohibition. And here's um, Al Capone's mug mugshot from 1931. I'm sure you've heard of him before. So let's talk about how it got repealed. Women. You know, they were active in getting prohibition passed. They were also just as active in the anti-prohibition campaign as they had been in the campaign to enact it. The Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform led the drive to repeal prohibition. The organization, they framed their argument, you know, they framed their campaign in moral terms. They argued that the effects of prohibition was that it caused a rise in criminal behavior, a rise in a criminal class like Al Capone, um, it led to the corruption of pil public officials who were paid off so that they would look the other way and not enforce the law. And there was a widespread disrespect for the rule of law. Like average Americans were disobeying this law. And they were like, this is a dangerous threat to, uh, it's undermining American law. When you have uh, almost every part of American society disobeying law, it basically, there's, they're, they're saying that it'll lead to uh, more and more crime being committed, right? Another factor that really uh, allowed for the repeal was the onset of the Great Depression. Because of the dire economic situation that was facing the country, the federal government really couldn't afford to let go of the tax revenues that it would get from production and consumption of alcoholic beverages. So women played a role in repealing prohibition, but so did the Great Depression. Um, the 21st Amendment is the amendment that repealed the 18th Amendment. It was ratified in 1933, and it ended the nation's ban on the manufacture and distribution of alcohol. Um, prohibition was definitely a social experiment, and it sought to 
address these social ills, these social problems that supposedly came about from industrialization, but clearly it ended up just causing more problems, right? Let's talk a little bit about consumption. So the prosperity of the 1920s led to new patterns of consumption. And consumption is purchasing consumer goods like radios, cars, vacuums, beauty products, or clothing. Um, the expansion of credit in the 1920s allowed for the sale of more consumer goods and put automobiles within reach of average Americans. So now individuals could, who couldn't normally afford to, per, uh, to purchase a car at a full price could pay for that car over time with interest, of course. And with so many new products and so many Americans eager to purchase them, advertising became a central institution in this new consumer economy. So let's talk about some cars. So new possibilities of mobility opened up in the 1920s for a large percentage of the population. What was once a luxury item, cars became within reach for many more consumers as car manufacturers began to mass produce automobiles. The most significant innovation uh, of this era was Henry Ford's Model T car, his Model T Ford, which made car ownership available to the average American. By the early 20th century, hundreds of car manufacturers existed, but they all made products that were too expensive for most Americans. Uh, Henry Ford's innovation lay in his use of mass production to manufacture automobiles. He revolutionized industrial work by perfecting the assembly, assembly line, which enabled him to lower the Model T's price from about $850 in 1908 to just $300 in 1924. And that made car ownership a very real possibility for a large share of the population. Um, soon, people could buy used Model T's for as little as $5, which allowed students and others with low incomes to enjoy the freedom and mobility of car ownership. Um, by 1929, there were over 23 million cars on American roads. The assembly line helped Ford to reduce labor costs within the production process by moving the product from one team of workers to the next, each of them completing a step that was so simple that workers had to be basically, according to what Henry Ford said, no smarter than, a, than an ox. And his reliance on the assembly line placed emphasis on efficiency over craftsmanship. And his focus on cheap mass production brought both um, benefits and disadvantages to his workers. So here is this advertisement for Ford's Model T. It ran in the New Orleans Times in 1911. And look at the prices uh, they had not yet, yet dropped far from their initial high of 850, but you can see they were dropping. So, like I said, his focus on cheap mass production brought pros and cons. Ford would not allow his workers to unionize, and the boring, repetitive nature of the assembly line work generated a high turnover rate, so people were leaving the work uh, very quickly, right? They got bored with it. On the other hand, Henry Ford doubled workers' pay to $5 a day, and he standardized the workday to eight hours, which was a reduction from the norm of the time. His assembly line also offered greater racial equality than most employment of the time. He paid white and black workers equally. And you know, seeking these wages, many African-Americans from the South moved to Detroit and other large Northern cities to work in factories like at Hen um, Henry Ford's factories. Uh, Henry Ford, he shaped the nation's mode of industrialism to rely on paying decent wages so that workers could afford to be the consumers of their own products. The car changed the face of America, both economically and socially. Industries like glass, steel, and rubber processing expanded and grew to try to keep up with auto production. The oil industry in California, Oklahoma, and Texas expanded as Americans became more reliant on oil. It increased, and the nation transitioned from a coal-based economy to one driven by petroleum, by oil. The need for public roadways uh, also required local and state governments to fund a dramatic expansion of infrastructure which permitted motels and restaurants to spring up 
and offer new services to millions of newly mobile Americans with cash to spend. With this new infrastructure, new shopping and living patterns emerged and streetcar suburbs gave way to car suburbs as private automobile traffic on public roads began to replace mass transit on trains and trolleys. And here is, uh, in this image is from 1928 from the Literary Digest, an interview with Henry Ford. And you can see workers on an assembly line producing new models of Ford's uh, automobiles. So the 1920s not only witnessed a transformation in ground transportation, but also major changes in air travel. By the mid-1920s, men had been flying for about two decades. And um, one of the founders of, like, the, one of the innovators of the airplane, Orville Wright, one of the pioneers of airplane technology, he once said that no flying machine will ever fly from New York to Paris because um, no known motor can run at the speed for four days uh, without stopping that's required. However, in 1927, this skepticism was put to rest when Charles Lindbergh became the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic. He flew from New York to Paris in just 33 hours. Um, and the picture on the left is him in front of the Spirit of St. Louis in 1927. So his flight made him an international hero, the best known American in the world. Uh, on his return, Americans greeted him with a parade. Um, his flight, which he completed in this monoplane called the Spirit of St. Louis, it seemed like a triumph of individualism in modern mass society. And it really exemplified Americans' ability to conquer the air with new technology. And following his success, um, companies like Boeing and Ford developed airplanes designed specifically for pa passenger air, tra um, air transport. Uh, so you had... Um, domestic air passenger travel happening as a result of this. And by the end of, I believe it was the 1930s, that the number of air passengers had increased to nearly 2 million people, right? So technological innovation influenced more than just transportation. As access to electricity became more common and the electric motor was made more efficient, inventors began to churn out new and more complex household appliances. Newly developed innovations like radios, phonographs, vacuum cleaners, washing machines, and refrigerators emerged on the market during this time. These items were expensive, but with credit, with store credit and installment pay payment plans, it made them available to a large segment of the population. And many of the new devices promised to give women who continue to have uh, primary responsibility for housework it gave them more opportunities to step out of the home and expand their horizons. Um, that was supposedly what it was supposed to do. However, these labor-saving devices actually tended to increase the workload for women by raising the standards of domestic work. With these tools, women ended up cleaning more frequently, washing more often, and cooking more elaborate meals than rather than uh, actually getting any more spare time. So uh, despite the fact that the promise of more leisure time didn't really come true, the lure of technology as the gateway to a more relaxed lifestyle continued. People still believed it. And this dream was really a testament to the influence of another growing industry, advertising. The mass consumption of cars, household appliances, ready to wear clothing and processed foods depended heavily on the work of advertisers. Magazines like Ladies Home Journal and the Saturday Evening Post became vehicles to try to connect advertisers and businesses with middle-class consumers. Um, colorful and occasionally provocative print advertisements decorated the pages of these magazines, these publications, and really became a staple in American popular culture. And on the right here, this is an advertisement for soap which appeared in Ladies Home Journal in 1922. And it claimed that the soap's moderate price is due to popularity, to the enormous demand which keeps um, palm olive factories working day and night. And so the old time luxury of the few may now be enjoyed the world over, right? So it's kind of saying everyone can, ha can have access to this. Let's move on to uh, movies, radio, and sports in the 1920s. So, um, again, 
The increased financial prosperity of the 1920s gave Americans more disposable income to spend on entertaining themselves. This influx of cash coupled with advancements in technology led to new patterns of leisure, time spent having fun, and consumption, which is buying products. In this period of the 1920s, movies and sports became increasingly popular while commercial radio and magazines turned athletes and actors into national icons. Um, as the popularity of moving pictures grew, movies, right, cinema, in the early part of the 1920s, movie palaces, which were capable of seating thousands, sprang up in major cities, huge movie theaters. A ticket for a double feature and a live show cost 25 cents. So for a quarter, Americans could escape from their problems and lose themselves in another era or a world, right? A new world. People of all ages attended the movies with far more regularity than today, often going more than once per week. By the end of the 1920s, weekly movie attendance swelled to 90 million people. The silent movies of the early 1920s gave rise to the first generation of movie stars. No star captured the attention of the American viewing public more than Charlie Chaplin. Um, you can see in this picture here, sad-eyed with a mustache, baggy pants, and a cane. He became the top box office attraction of his time, one of the most well-known and famous actors uh, in all of history. Um, his nickname, The Tramp, came from the recurring ca character that he played in many of his silent films, uh, such as The Kid. Um, and that's what you see here um, is a picture from that from that movie. So in 1927, the world of the silent movie began to kind of decline when the first talkie movie came out where there was actual dialogue, um, heard dialogue. And that was called The Jazz Singer. And the plot of this film starred Al Jolson and it told a very American story of the 1920s. It followed the life of a Jewish man from his boyhood days of being groomed to be the cantor at a local synagogue to his life as a famous and Americanized jazz singer. And both the story and the new sound technology that were used to produce this movie were popular with audiences around the country and it quickly became a huge hit. And uh, you had the decline of the silent films and the talkies became popular, which is what we technically have today. We have talking films, right? Southern California in the 1920s, however, had only recently become the center of the American film industry. Film production was originally based in and around New York, where Thomas Edison first debuted the Kinetoscope in 1893. But in the 1910s, as filmmakers like D.W. Griffith looked to escape the cost of Thomas Edison's patents on camera equipment, this began to change. When Griffith filmed um, this movie called In Old California, it was the first movie ever shot in Hollywood, California in 1910. Uh, the small town, the small town of Hollywood was in 1910, just a, basically a village. But as movie makers flocked to Southern California more and more, not least because you know they wanted the better climate, the more favorable climate and sunshine, Hollywood swelled with movie making activity. By the 1920s, the once sleepy village of Hollywood was now home to a profitable and innovative US industry. The, after being introduced during World War I, radios became a common feature in American homes in the 1920s. Hundreds of radio stations popped up over the course of the 1920s. These stations developed and broadcasted news serial stories and political speeches. Um, much like in print media, like in magazines, advertising space was interspersed with entertainment in radio. Yet, unlike magazines and newspapers, advertisers did not have to spend or have to depend on the active participation of consumers. Advertisers could reach out to anyone within listening distance of the radio. On the other hand, a broader audience meant that advertisers had to be more conservative and careful not to offend anyone because anybody could be listening. Um, here is a photograph of the Brock sisters. It was a popular singing trio and they were listening to the radio together in the mid 1920s. 
So the power of radio further accelerated the process of creating a shared nat national culture that had started when railroads and telegraphs widened the distribution of newspapers. Radio, though, was far more effective than these print media. Radio created and pumped out American culture onto the airwaves and into the homes, directly into the homes of families around the country. Um, there were radio programs like Amos and Andy that began in the 1920s and they entertained listeners around the country. Um, some of these, like Amos and Andy, they, they actually portrayed negative racial stereotypes about African Americans. Um, with the radio, Americans from coast to coast could listen to exactly the same program at the same time. And this had the effect of smoothing out regional differences in dialect, language, music, and consumer taste, right? So it caused America to have more of a shared culture. Radio also transformed how Americans enjoyed sports. The introduction of play-by-play -play descriptions of sporting events broadcasted over the radio brought sports entertainment right into the homes of millions of Americans. Radio helped to popularize sports figures and their accomplishments. Um, for example, Jim Thorpe, who grew up in the uh, Sac and Fox Nation in Oklahoma, was known as one of the best athletes in the world. He medaled in the 1912 Olympic Games, played uh, Major League Baseball, and one was, was one of the founding members of the NFL. Other sports superstars were household names as well. In 1926, Gertrude Ederly became the first woman to swim the English Channel. Helen Wills dominated women's tennis, winning Wimbledon eight times in the late 1920s. Um, Big Bill Tilden won the national singles title every year from 1920 to 1925. In football, Harold uh, Red Grange, he played for the University of Illinois, averaging over 10 yards per carry during his college career. The biggest star though, of all of them, was called the Sultan of Swat. Babe, Babe Ruth, and he became America's first baseball hero and again was became a household name. So let's talk a bit about American culture in the 1920s. The experience of the Western countries in the First World War was disheartening, disillusioning. These civilized countries had declared war on each other for uncertain reasons. They fought to a stalemate in brutal trench, work, trench warfare conditions and had then negotiated a, a peace settlement that didn't really settle the underlying causes of tension and it didn't really truly bring peace. And the nationalistic fervor that had motivated many Americans and Europeans to enlist in the war effort dissipated in the muddy trenches of battle where the purpose and aims of the war seemed distant and unclear. Um, the very nature of the war called into question the West's perception of itself as civilized. Um, and it's no wonder then that many in the United States and Europe began to question the values and assumptions of Western civilization after the war. The lost generation refers to the generation of writers, artists, musicians, and intellectuals that came of age during World War I and the Roaring Twenties. The carnage and destruction of World War I stripped away this generation of their illusions about democracy and peace and prosperity, right? And kind of threw a wrench into that. And many of them expressed doubt and cynicism in some of their artistic endeavors, right? They, they, were, they were pessimistic about life after World War I. Some of the most famous lost generation writers were F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, Gertrude Stein, T.S. Eliot, Ernst Hemingway, um, John Steinbeck. Many of these writers lived as expatriates in Paris, which played host to a flourishing artistic and cultural scene during this time. The themes of moral de degeneracy, corruption, and decadence were prominent in many of their works. Um, one of them, again, F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, The Great Gatsby, is a classic of this, this genre um, during this period. And on the right is a picture of Ernst Hemingway in Paris in 1924, right? One of the famous writers. Now let's talk about jazz. So jazz music became wildly popular in the 1920s, in the Roaring Twenties, which was a decade that witnessed unprecedented economic growth and prosperity in the U.S., Consumer culture flourished with even greater numbers of Americans purchasing automobiles, electrical appliances, and other widely available consumer product products. 
The achievement of material wealth and affluence became a goal for many citizens, as well as an object of satire and ridicule for the writers and intellectuals of the lost generation. Te technological innovations like the telephone and radio uh, altered the social lives of Americans while transforming the entertainment industry. Suddenly, musicians could create phonograph recordings of their compositions. For jazz music, which was improvisational, the development of the phonograph technology was transformative. Um, before, music lovers would actually have to attend a nightclub or concert venue to hear jazz. Now they could listen on the radio or even purchase their favorite recordings for at-home listening, thanks to the phonograph. After Congress passed the Volstead Act in 1919, which banned the manufacture and sale of alcohol, many Americans sought refuge in speakeasies and other entertainment venues that hosted jazz bands. Um, Harlem's Cotton Club was one uh, famous venue where both these speakeasies were both whites and blacks gathered to listen to jazz, to dance, dance the Charleston, and to illegally drink alcohol, booze. Women attended jazz clubs in large numbers, and the flapper girl became a staple of U.S. pop culture. These women, these flapper girl women, they, they flouted um, orthodox gender norms. They rejected it. They bobbed their hair, if you know what the uh, bob hairstyle looks like. They smoked cigarettes, and they basically engaged in other behaviors that were traditionally associated with men. Um, the Harlem Renaissance was a flourishing of African-American art, music, literature, and poetry that was centered in New York City's Harlem neighborhood. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, County Cullen and Langston Hughes were among the most famous African-American authors associated with this movement, the Harlem Renaissance. African-Americans also dominated the jazz scene in the 1920s. For example, Duke, Duke Ellington, who frequently performed at the Cotton Club, was one of the most uh, influential jazz band leaders and composers of all time. Uh, this roaring 20s, though, screeched to a halt on October 29th, 1929, uh, which was also known as Black Tuesday, when the collapse of stock, stock prices on Wall Street ushered in the Great Depression, which we'll talk to talk about in upcoming lessons. So this is a picture of Jazz Orchestra in Texas in 1921, what it looks like if you want to pause and take a look. So let's talk about politics now in the 1920s. The election of 1920 saw the weakening of the Democratic Party. The death of Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson's ill health meant that it was the passing of a generation of progressive leaders. They were gone. The uh, waning of the Red Scare took with it the last vestiges of progressive zeal. And Wilson's support of the League of Nations basically turned Irish and German immigrants against the Democrats. Americans were tired of reform, tired of witch hunts, and were more than ready to for a return to normalcy. And above that, the 1920s signaled a return to a pro-business government almost a return to the laissez-faire economic policy of the Gilded Age of the late 1800s. Um, Calvin Coolidge's statement basically symbolizes this period. The chief business of the American people is business, and that became the dominant attitude of the 1920s in terms of politics. So Warren Harding, in the election of 1920, uh, professional Republicans were eager to nominate a man who they whom they could manage and control basically and warren harding was a senator from ohio and he was that guy before his nomination he said he stated america's present need is not heroics but healing not nostrums but normalcy not revolution but restoration um he was a pretty like nice guy kind of um he was known for enjoying golf, alcohol, poker. Um, his critics, though, depicted him as weak, lazy, incompetent. Um, but, you know, together with his running mate, Calvin Coolidge, his VP, they attracted the votes of many Americans who sought Harding's promised return to normalcy. And in the election, uh, Harding defeated Governor James Cox of Ohio by the greatest majority in the history of two-party politics. He won 61% of the vote. And you can see him here in 1919 in this picture. So his cabinet 
reflected his pro-business agenda. Um, his uh, Secretary of Commerce was Herbert Hoover. He was a millionaire, mechanical engineer, and miner. Um, his Secretary of the Treasury, Andrew Mellon, was also a pro-business multimillionaire with a fortune built in banking and aluminum. And he was consistent with his principles. War, uh, Warren Harding ran the government with business-like efficiency. He proposed and signed into law tax rate cuts, as well as the country's first formal budgeting process, which created a presidential budget director and required that the president submit an annual budget to Congress. And these policies helped to reduce the, the debt that the U.S. had incurred during World War I. However, as Europe began to recover, U.S. exports to the continent, to Europe, dwindled. And in an effort to protect American agriculture and other businesses threatened by lower priced imports, he pushed through the emergency tariff in 1921. And this had the effect of increasing American purchasing power, but it also inflated the price of many goods. Um, in the era of, area of foreign policy, he worked to preserve the peace through international cooperation and the reduction of armaments of weapons around the world. Despite the refusal of the U.S. Senate to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, Harding was able to work with Germany and Austria to, become, to secure a formal peace. And he convened a conference in Washington called the Washington Naval Conference that brought together world leaders, uh, brought them all together to agree on reducing the threat of future wars by reducing armaments. Um, out of these negotiations came a number of treaties that were designed to foster cooperation, um, like in East Asia and the Far East. Um, it reduced the size of navies around the world and established guidelines for submarine usage. These agreements they fell apart in the 1930s as the world descended into the Second World War, World War II. But at the time, these agreements were seen as a promising path to maintaining peace. Um, so let's talk about Harding, his successor. So despite these developments, the Harding uh, administration had gone down in history as one of the most, as especially ridden with scandal. Uh, while Harding himself was personally honest, he surrounded himself with politicians who weren't. Harding made the mistake of often turning to advisors um, who got into trouble, right? These scandals mounted quickly during his term. From 1920 to 1923, Secretary of the Interior Albert B. Fall was involved in a scam that became known as the Teapot Dome Scandal. He had leased Navy reserves in Teapot Dome, Wyoming, and two other sites in California to private oil companies without opening the bidding to other companies. In exchange for that, the companies gave him $300,000 in cash and bonds, as well as a herd of cattle for his ranch. And because of this, he was convicted of accepting bribes from the oil companies. He was fined $100,000 and sentenced to a year in prison. And it was the very first time that a cabinet official had received such a sentence. And here on the left is Teapot Rock in Wyoming, near the oil fields at the heart of the Teapot Dome scandal. In 1923, Harding also learned that the head of the Veterans Bureau, Colonel Charles Forbes, had absconded with most of the... $250 million that were set aside for extravagant bureau functions. So he basically took money that was meant to go to the Veterans Bureau and he just, he ran off with it. And Harding allowed the Colonel Forbes to resign and leave the country. But after Harding died, Forbes returned to the country and was tried, convicted, and he was sentenced to two years in prison. So although the Harding presidency had a number of large successes and variety of dark scandals, it ended before the term was even up. In July 1923, while he was traveling in Seattle, the president suffered a heart attack. And on August 2nd, he suffered a stroke and died in San Francisco, leaving the presidency to his vice president, Calvin Coolidge. Um, so we're going to talk about him next, Calvin Coolidge. He's the last one we're going to talk about. So Calvin Coolidge, he... In the presidential election of 1920, he was the vice president, right? 
He ran alongside William Harding. They won their landslide. And um, he became the first vice president in history to be invited um, or to, he, he, su he succeeded Warren G. Harding, right? After his death during the term. Uh, he wasn't shot or anything. Remember, he was, he died of natural causes, stroke and heart attack. So while he was on that speaking tour, President Harding died of a ce cerebral hemorrhage, right? Stroke. And um, he had been popular and the nation was shocked, but Coolidge took over. He took office and ascended to the presidency on August 3rd. So as president, he set to work on cutting taxes, reducing federal spending. In 1924, he signed the Immigration Act, which imposed limits on immigration from parts of Eastern and Southern Europe. Um, in 1924, he ran for president in his own right, right? So he, he had succeeded and become president because the other president died. But now he's going to run for president on his own on the Republican Party ticket. And he won the popular vote in almost every state outside of the South. Um, during his second term in office, the country experienced a period of economic growth and low unemployment. Coolidge uh, believed in the laissez-faire ideology of free market capitalism. He believed the government should stay out of the economy and let it do its thing. And his administration lowered income taxes, cut spending, and limited federal regulation of the economy. The federal debt and budget deficit shrank and the economy boomed. And some have argued, however, that uh, Coolidge's laissez-faire approach to the economy actually brought on the Great Depression. In terms of foreign policy, the Coolidge administration was hesitant to cultivate alliances with foreign powers. Coolidge himself was kind of ambivalent about U.S. entry into the League of Nations. So he was like, meh, so-so about it. He really didn't care. Um, even though he didn't oppose the League of Nations in principle, he really doubted that it would effectively serve American interests. His major foreign policy initiative was the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which was an agreement between the United States, the United Kingdom, Japan, France, Italy, and Germany. They all agreed to renounce war as an instrument of national policy. Um, even though the pact did not prevent sec the Second World War, did not prevent World War II, it did constitute one of the enduring principles of international law in the post-war period. Um, Coolidge chose not to run for re-election in the 1928 presidential campaign, and he was succeeded in office by Herbert Hoover, a Republican who had served as the Secretary of Commerce in the Coolidge administration, and someone we will learn about um, in upcoming lessons. So let me know if you have any questions about this assignment, and I'll be sure to try to help you out.